Hi, Kathy Garver. Welcome to Lights, Camera, Author. Well, thank you very much, Jim. It's nice to be here. I've got the well, lights, I've got the camera, and here's the author. So <laughs> we're ready to go. I tell you what, we, uh, I tell you what, we, this show has been a fun show to do for the past year and a half, and I really appreciate you being here. And um, now, Surviving Sissy is your memoir, and the paperback version is coming out in, here in 2021, I believe in March, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, right, in the springtime. Now, that is just in time for the 55th anniversary of Family Affair. Wait a minute now. It can't be 55 because I'm only 39, Jim, and <laughs> I'm from this show. I tell you what, I'm the same way, except I've celebrated 39 almost 30 times now. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always a good year to celebrate. Exactly. So, but yeah, I mean, it has, does it seem that long? Oh, gosh, no. It seems like yesterday. And I, I've been really reminiscing because, and because of the anniversary, I'm coming out with another book. Surviving Sissy will be out in paper book uh, because I had the hardcover come out about five years ago. So now they're bringing it out in the paper uh, back version. But I'm uh, having one book come out called The Family Affair Pictorial Scrapbook. And I have been going through all the pictures and memorabilia and that is all going, it's really going to come together pretty quickly and will be out in about three months. And that's to go along with the museum exhibit of all the family affair memorabilia at the Hollywood Museum. If we can ever open LA, we've got to ask uh, Mr. Newsom about that, but. <laughs> if they ever, if they ever lift the lockdown, right. I mean, it's, yes. it's all over Where are place. you? I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Ah, I'm coming and, to Roanoke. Oh, you really? In April. Oh, let me know and I'll make, I'll try and make my way down there. Oh, please do. Yeah, it's in um, April this, I think 17th, April 17th, 18th and 19th. It's a Happy Trails Media Festival. It's really nice. There'll be some interesting people there. Oh, fantastic. I'll, yeah. I'll get in contact with them. Yeah. Now, for those of you who don't, who may have been living in the cave for past, past 50 years, you were sissy on Family Affair, the older sister of the two, of the, uh, two sisters, Buffy, An Anissa Jones, and Jody, the, the boy, the brother, uh, played by Johnny Whitaker. But before Family Affair, though, you had a, you had a great career already. Uh, you I started, started as a, yeah. I mean, you started with, like when you were four years old, I believe? Well, I actually was three when I started taking tap and lessons and uh, singing lessons at the Meglin Studios. And that's where they discovered Shirley Temple. So of course my mother of all the mothers in Hollywood thought that their daughter is going to be the next Shirley Temple. And I had my hair and, and little ringlets, et cetera. But so that was, and one of the first live presentations I did was on at the Big Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, where they used to have the Oscars and where they had things like Aida with big elephants going across the stage. So here I am, this tiny little girl tap dancing with my fellow tap dancers on, on that big stage. But that was really the debut. Oh, wow. And But then you had, did you start out in commercials? Is that what you started out in? Or no, really, it? I started out with movies. Movies, and, The Night of the uh, Hunter, right? The, the first movie I did was The Night of the Hunter, mm -hmm. which was just a really... It's now been claimed as uh, in the top 100 of the best horror films ever made. It starred Robert Mitchum and Lillian Gish and Shelley Winters. And it, it was a fabulous cast. Directed and by Charles Lofton. Exactly. His first and last picture because it got awful reviews. And he says, are you kidding? And, you know, and he put his heart and his soul and he was so wonderful in doing it. And the cinematography in the black and white was, they say now, you know, uh, a German expressionist kind of a film. And it was so ahead of the time that the audience didn't quite know what to do. And as I say, later it's been heralded as one of the best pictures ever made, but poor Charles Lawton said, oh, they hate my movie. And <laughs> he never directed again. And that was a sad tale. It was sad. And you were the body, you were the body double yes. for the little girl. That's so right. I appeared in a lot of the scenes and I, I uh, was her double, uh, Sally Jane Bruce. The, 
I remember in the book you were talking about a story. I want to I want to say that it was a scene in the boat. Ah, yes. Ah, yes. Well, I had my own way of, of wanting to do a scene. And uh, little girls, you know, have an opinion here, budding actresses. So we're uh, going, I'm in the little skiff and we're going down this uh, handmade river um, at, in Culver City in the back lot, as they called it. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking like this, and and Billy Chapin, who played John John, the, uh, my brother, is saying, "Oh, looks like we're we're not going to have anything more to eat." And I'm like, oh. like this, you know. And I was sad. And then not just no, no, keep your head up, keep your head up. I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm arguing with him the way that this scene should be done at like eight years old, just turned eight. I loved how you were telling me about Robert Mitchum. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, Robert Mitchum <laughs> plays a real bad guy in this movie. And but off the off screen, he was a big of a big uh, prankster, wasn't he? Uh, he was a prankster and and he had a tendency to really have a good time on the set by by having a little booze every now and again. But uh, one and time he that he, he <laughs> stole Shelley Winter's chair and it was uh, it was quite uh, it was quite an experience. And my son, when he was 12, I said, um, oh, well, yeah, you can watch this movie. You know, he was 12 and the um, the preacher was this horrible person, Robert Mitchum, and he had L O V E written on one of his on one hand on his knuckles, and then he had H A T E written on the other hand, and so he would get up and he preach, and love comes in, and then hate comes in, and then hate comes over, but love, love, you know, conquers all. Now, this this uh, preacher has already killed two men. So I said, Reed, how, how did you like this movie? He says, oh, mom, it was really neat. He says, look, L-O-V-E, H-A-T-E. -E. And I said, oops, <laughs> maybe that wasn't exactly the right movie to show to my 12-year-old. <laughs> Peter Graves was in that movie, one of his first roles. Yes, yeah. And you and, and he him was, And he was wonderful. He played the father of the of the two kids. Uh, and he they he had stolen this money and when the bank robbery and he was in a jail and then that's how he met the preacher who came to try and get the money i tell you what and you were cutting up the you cutting up i was cutting bills. up the the, the money <laughs> <laughs> right then stuffing it into a doll fake money as we we won't point that fake, out you fake, weren't fake cutting... money fake yeah. money. i wouldn't ever <laughs> i mean if i see a little rip in a dollar bill i tape it i remember now you talked also about you being in the ten commandments and you uh now there were some urban myths about that about that movie true and that um about i want to say cecil b demille wanted to get a shot but nobody had the uh had the cameras rolling well what happened and uh cecil b demille was this fabulous fabulous director and there was a scene and I, I was Rachel the slave girl and there is a scene when the Red Sea is closing and my job was to be on this paper mache mountain they had built the Red Sea at Paramount and to go up into the arms of Nina Foch now it took Tim forever to set up this scene because they had all the extras you know going through the Red Sea and the donkey and the and the oxen and the camels all of that and then they had big vats of water along the catwalk and when DeMille was says action all the water is supposed to descend on on everybody like the Red Sea is closing so it took all this time to get it together but finally he did and because it took a long time he had three cameras so he had one camera to get the, the big shot, and then he had another camera to get another angle. But just to be sure, he put another camera way back up on the catwalk. So finally, everything is set. He yells, action! And I go up into Nina Foch's arms, and, and the uh, cattle and the oxen go through, and the extras, and uh, the water comes down. And, he says, cut. He says, great. And he says, camera number one, how was it for you? And the cameraman said, oh, Mr. DeMille, I am so sorry, but 
a camel walked in front of the lens. I didn't get the shot. You didn't get the shot. It wasn't a happy director, <laughs> but he has the other cameraman getting the other view. So he says, camera number two, how was it for you? Oh, Mr. DeMille, I am so sorry. Water splashed on the lens and I didn't get it. You didn't get the shot. You didn't get the shot. I'm sorry. Well, now he was really beside himself. He was, uh, DeMille was very upset. And then he remembered the third cameraman way back up on the catwalk. So he said, camera number three, how was it for you? And the cameraman said, ready when you are, CB. <laughs> and that's a true story. It's not apocryphal. That really happened. I was there, but that, that really was true. Well, you know, so many things happen when you're shooting a movie. Oh my gosh. But this was a big movie. But you also, I mean, what I, one of the things I liked about your book is that every every chapter title, it's like you're building a quilt. Yeah. Or a, tap or a tapestry, but I, I guess quilt is more accurate. Yes, you know, and that just kind of came to me as I was getting into the book. And I says, oh, well, this is another piece of, of the fabric of my life. And, oh, well, yes. So that was another little piece that I could sew together. So it became this big metaphor of building, you know, or sewing together one's life and the different pieces that you, you put into it. That's incredible. That's really clever. That's, you know, and, but um, now you, uh, let's flash forward just a little bit because you start the book by telling about this audition that you had for Family Affair. And you had, like you have now blonde hair and we know Sissy is, is a brunette on the show, but well, you, she uh, was actually a redhead. Redhead. Okay. Yeah. She was a redhead. I had a black and white TV when I was a kid. <laughs> well, do you know, I mean, family affair was one of the first oh, shows in color. I, I so, know. Yeah. So everything in the black and white, and then they had the kaleidoscope to make a, Hey, this is now in color. <laughs> But you you were dressed in a you 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 were dressed in a in a a blue dress. We talked about that, and when they called you back, they told you, "Don't wear the dress." Well, what happened is that I was actually at UCLA and at a sorority and, and going to college, and they wanted a fifteen year old girl. And my mom, I love my mom. I love my mom. You know, she called me up. She said, "You have an audition." you know, um, in, in Hollywood for a new series. And they've already sold the series and they've cast everybody except for this part. She said, the only problem is they want a blonde uh, and you have to be 15. Now at that time, I did have very dark hair and I have still dark eyes. They didn't have those uh, contact lenses back there. But my mom, ever the bright creative woman that she was brought this stuff over and you probably don't know about this Jim but this was called streaks and tips and this <laughs> was a spray in the 60s that you put on your hair and it instantly changed it to blood but now see my my hair is a little foppy well my mom put this stuff on my hair did not move I mean it was like a helmet I had on my hair but we, I bravely went in and I wear my, my, my sweet little, um, my sweet little dress. And he, uh, he says, well, he says, this is, this is nice. He says, what's wrong with your hair? I, I said, my hair. And he said, yes, it's turning green. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it must be the light. Like these ring lights we have now, it must be the light. So we got into a nice conversation. And so he liked me and the blue dress you're talking about. So. I did a, uh, a screen test after I had met the producer and they got me like this blue and white check dress out of Alice in Wonderland. And they had this long blonde wig <laughs> I wore. And so I remember being in the sorority pie fight and got the call and it was my agent. And she says, oh, you got the job. You're going to play sissy. She says, the only thing is never wear that wig again and never wear that blue dress. <laughs> said, you got it. But I tell you, but you did land the job in what, five years, I believe it was on TV. It's never been off. It's never been no, five years. Yeah. It lasted originally five years after the third year they had it syndicated. So it was starting already to play in different places. 
So they'd have something on the afternoon and then the new ones on at night. And what I didn't realize is that even after that CBS uh, canceled it, ABC wanted to pick it up. That's right. And so um, they were all about to sign on the dotted line, Don Featherson, who was our producer. And then someone came in there with six kids instead of three kids and a little doll that looked exactly <laughs> very much like a uh, Mrs. Beasley doll with a little girl with their hair in pigtails. And guess what the name of that show was? The Brady Bunch. Exactly. So they said, oh, well, your, your show has been on five years. Here's something that's very similar. And so we're just going to take the Brady Bunch instead, a family affair. But Man. that's Hollywood. That's true. That is true. Now, you, you also you also uh, go into the uh, a short little biographies of each cast member um i gotta ask you this um you know you you did great after i mean you did great after after you left you were always working you didn't you didn't you, you had some issues with a fire and and health and your your husband's health issues and your health issues but they didn't seem to be like well like say brian keith he went on to a successful career in tv and movies but you know he uh, he had a sad end um anisa anisa jones we all know what happened with her uh 18 years old she you know she passes away due to a drug overdose johnny whitaker had got involved with drugs but now he pulled himself together um sebastian cabot you know um he he had a stroke after the show was over do you believe the show was cursed no uh -uh. I, you know, pe people say that, oh, the show was cursed, but things happen to people. And I don't think that things are cursed. I, I, I believe that people are in charge of their own lives with uh, a connection to God. And, you know, if you don't have some kind, in my opinion, if you don't have some kind of a spiritual base or a spiritual resource, you're really in trouble. In, in many, many ways, I think. And um, I wrote another book called Ex Child Stars, Where Are They Now? Mm -hmm. And so many of my, my peers and, and other uh, ex child stars uh, have had such a hard time trying to adjust to uh, an adult position, an adult actor, et cetera, et cetera. So like um, Brian, did have a strong connection to God, but he had been given two weeks to live. And he even that. went to his priest before, you know, he says, I, I can't take this pain anymore. And, you know, if there was assisted suicides or whatever that were more prevalent back then, perhaps he could have gone that route, but he was in charge of his own life, Brian was, and he was going to be in charge of his own death. And then poor Anissa, you know, had had really no resources. She was an atheist and, you know, and, and um, she got involved with the wrong crowd. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she was just on this path where she didn't know what to do. And I tried to help. And then her mom called and said, can you come over and talk with Anissa because she's in the wrong crowd taking drugs. And I had I had to leave the next day to, I went back East to, to do a play for three months. And unfortunately that's, that's what happened. And Johnny, again, you know, it's making the decisions of, am I going to take drugs? Am I not going to take drugs? And um, being, you know, if a person's a little depressed or despondent and that's, you know, the way it goes like today, I mean, and my d dear friend, Don Wells, you know, I, Mm -hmm. who just passed away at the in the end of December, you know, she was depressed and she and she was, I think, full of despair. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, it's in so many people that are locked up, you know, and can't get out or only have themselves and they don't have other people. Hi, Jules, so you've got a dog. I love <laughs> two dogs. <laughs> you can't be, you here, can't Jules. be depressed if you have a dog. <laughs> now she's, but Johnny Whitaker, he pulled himself together after, after getting involved. Well, yeah, uh, Johnny um, was on like heroin and cocaine and all of this stuff and drinking and um, was almost homeless. And his family had a big Mormon family came and said, look, 
if you don't get off drugs, we're going to divorce you as a family. So that finally got through to him and, and he did. And now, now he has been clean and sober for a while. That's fantastic. That's great. Yeah. Did you have a Miss Beasley doll? Oh, I have a couple of them. Two oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> and I, I, I would show one to you, but I just took them down and, and put them in the garage. No problem. People see kids nowadays don't realize how big Mrs. Beasley was back in yeah. the 60s. Um, the doll that that um, Buffy carried with her everywhere. Right. And um, some of my favorite, I remember some of my favorite episodes was when Miss Beasley would get lost or something would happen to Miss Beasley where she lost an arm or something like that. Right. And, and going through the memorabilia, there's like this family affair game and it's where's Mrs. Beasley? So they took one of the stories from the show and they actually made a, a game, a board game out of it. I, I, I didn't realize some of the guest stars that were on the show. I didn't remember this. So Joan Blondell and Ann Southern, Myrna Loy, Jackie Coogan. I mean, y'all had some big names on that show. We did. And they were wonderful. We had an old time director um, for the last four years and he had directed a lot of the Abbott and Costello movies and he knew a, a lot of the people as did our um, one of our producers Edmund Hartman we're actually working on uh, one that Ed Hartman's grandson is working with us called Aunt Sissy which is a spin-off from uh, Family Affair and guess who plays Aunt Sissy <laughs> let me guess would it be the person I'm talking to <laughs> it could be <laughs> when will that be on the air we're well, we've already made the pilot and we are um, we're shopping it around to a couple different places. And I have another show that was just bought by Retro TV. And so that will be on in about four months. Oh. And uh, so I, I've been actually very busy during this COVID period, it seems. Um, when, when you can't go out so much, as I say, I have my, the Family Affair pictorial book coming out and I'm doing another book uh, TV dinners book. Yeah. Um, they're all coming out in the spring. And of course the paperback, uh, I don't have to do anything with that except for <laughs> herald it and advertise it and say, Oh, I have this wonderful book. Go buy it. Well, I tell you, and then you also, uh, but you were on the dating game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Unfortunately, the date that you picked, uh, I guess liked boys didn't he <laughs> yeah yeah I was actually on it three times and the first time uh we went to Rio de Janeiro and um <laughs> we had a chaperone and she was just 21 the chaperone I was older than our chaperone so he got lost in, and there was lots of adventures with him and then there was another one where we went to San Sebastian Spain and um it turned out that that he liked guys and he didn't like <laughs> girls so much. So then I hung out with the with the chaperone while I was there, and then the third time, it those wonderful European trips they had reduced their budget, and so it was a trip to from L.A. up to Lake Tahoe, and the guy that I chose didn't even want to go, so I took my boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> but, now you. Uh I take it your leg is, is healed now? Oh, you broke yeah. your leg? I broke my leg. I, um, it was my son's eighth birthday. And I had, you know, dropped him off for school. I had the uh, ice skating rink. Or, you know, it was a roller skating rink all set up. I just had to uh, get the cake. So I um, dropped him at school. And I said, well, I need to get some exercise before all this hoopla is going to take place. So I lived in the hills. And so I was going down a hill and all of a sudden I slipped up like this and fell down. And it was like one of those, those joke, in a way, uh, Pratt Falls. But I heard something go, and I said, oh. And I started yelling and screaming, no drama queen me. And so this, psychologist stopped by in this car he heard the screaming and then there was this gardener that was in the area and stopped and heard me so they came up and and then the lady in the house but uh i i was so grateful 
to the gardener, I said, oh, uy, muchas gracias, muchas gracias, uy, es, es de muy bueno, gracias, gracias. And then I can hear the psychologist on the phone. He says, no, I can't ask her any questions. She only speaks Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> but it happened. I, I I broke my tibula and my fibula. And oh I was God. thinking of poor Tiger Woods, you know, because he broke his legs and he had all these rods and steel pins. And my doctor said to me, he said, now I can put in these rods, but you're going to have a big, you know, uh, scar on, on your leg. But you'll, you know, it's going to help you. Or I can put you in a cast. You'll be in a cast for six months. I said, put me in a cast. Yeah. And, and he thought, so you still have to go to surgery because they have to <laughs> put mm -hmm. the leg back together because it was a little crooked at that point. But uh, they give you this uh, painkiller. And that was, I didn't know where I was. I said, oh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, one last question, really, because I don't want to keep you all night. But, um, you know, because life hasn't always been rose up all oh, better roses because you know you broke your leg your your husband had a real serious uh illness and um and you you're, you lost your house during a fire so i, I guess i want to ask how important is faith oh. during all this time oh my gosh i i sincerely do not know where i would be if if i did not have god I, you know, I, I swear to God, there are so many, I swear to God, but there are so many things that, that happen and uh, disappointments in life. And, um, I, I have, I, I say prayers every night and I believe in God and I believe that what I am doing is guided by him. And as I get older and older, I, I want to use all the talents that I have been given, like in the Bible, you have talents. And I want to use them all up before I go. And I want, and I am busier than I have ever been writing books, appearing in movies, you know, doing audio books. And, and it's a purpose driven life as, as one of our authors have, have written a, a per, if you have a purpose in life and it gives you something to live for i am a happy person when i get up in the morning and i say is it time to get up and go do fun things and do you know make something happen and produce something and talk to jim and talk to the people <laughs> out there and um but and my son is it's it's not that you are so religious it, it is just that you have a spirit and he uh he made a reference to, to something the other day. He says, well, I thank God that that, that happened. And so that, that recognition, uh, I just think gives you a little bit more ballast in life. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Well, Kathy, thank you for being here. The book is Surviving Sissy. And I just can... happen to have a copy of it here. <laughs> and you can get this one on Amazon, or you can go to my website, kathygarver.com. I'm see, isn't that awful? <laughs> Shameless self-promotion, Kathy Garver, K-A-T-H-Y-G-A-R-V-E-R.com, kathygarver.com to get this one or to get X Child Stars, <laughs> which is a really good book. Um, or if you like to cook, here was my first book was the family affair cookbook and then this came out two years ago this is um holiday recipes for a family affair my new cookbook will be out tv dinners and uh the pictorial uh family affair scrapbook will be out i'm on facebook twitter <laughs> <laughs> like me on facebook and i'll like you back all right i sure will all right well kathy again thanks for being on light camera author Thank you for having me, Jim. It was really fun.